Uh, hey, we're back for part two of this discussion. Uh, part two is about something called the social construction of reality, which is also kind of a product of its time. Um, the 1960s, we're going into the 19th. So C. Wright Mills and the sociological imagination comes out of the late 50s and the Cold War. And uh, the sociological imagination comes out of the 60s. And why does this matter? Well, um, something we'll get into at the very end of the class is the baby boom, uh, the incredible amounts of young people uh, that in the 1960s started going to college. There was just an explosion of young people um, be because the end of World War II led to the baby boom. And all those people started turning 18 in the 60s and going to college. And so college enrollment exploded. I mean, places like PCC were invented. Community colleges were built all across the country because there were so many people uh, who were going to college, so many 18-year-olds, uh, especially who didn't want to go to the war in Vietnam. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> do you think my students are going to be paying attention to me or you, Cozy? Me. Yeah. Well, that's why I think we might not be able to do this because. Okay. Oh, I'm going in my. Cave. Go in your little cave. Um. Sorry. Um. And so you know, you know, a lot, a lot of them are going to go to college to get take classes that will help you get a job, but also people started taking a lot of liberal arts classes just to fill their requirements. Uh, and I mean, when I went to college, I went uh, to be a medical doctor, uh, but I took started taking sociology and philosophy. You know, you just take philosophy, and all of a sudden, their head explodes. So there was a lot of people taking sociology and philosophy who never even thought about it before, because so many people were just cramming into colleges. And also, by the way, at that time, uh, not only did you have the Beatles, you had Bob Dylan, you had grass, as they used to call it, weed, LSD. So there was a lot of mind expanding that was happening. So this, there's a book that comes out in 1966 called the Social Construction of Reality by Peter Berger and Gerhard Luckman. And it makes people's heads explode. I'm going to whisper something to you. Okay. 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 <laughs> Go get the cookie. Um, so, yeah. So, this book comes out, uh, Berger and Luckman's Social Construction Rally, and it really, it becomes hugely popular, partially because, like, so many people were stoned in 1966 listening to Bob Dylan, but it was just, it's one of those concepts that will really <sighs> send your head around, and I love talking about it right at the beginning. Um, so let's, we're going to, um, we're going to sort of dive into this and not the basic idea. We're going to get to kind of the definition of the social construction of reality is our definition of reality is very narrow. What we think of as the real world or, or the real thing. It's very narrow and we just sort of take it for granted. That's just the way, that's just the way it is. Uh, but knowledge is influenced by our environment. It's influenced by kind of four things, three of which we've already talked about. It's influenced by where we are in the social structure. Number one. You know, so where we are on the class ladder, for example. So I grew up in kind of a working class environment, uh, and but I went to a very bourgeois, rich school, and I got invited to a wedding in um, in um, Long Island that you had to rent a, tech, a tux for. <laughs> I just showed up for this wedding, like, you have to have a tuxedo to get in the door. I'm like, what? And this huge dinner. And one of the things that was very clear to me that I didn't know before is, did you know that there's more than one type of fork? There's more than one type of fork. There's dinner forks and salad forks and dessert forks and cocktail forks. There's all, they have all these forks laid out. Like, isn't one enough? But the, the reality in that sort of upper crust society is that you had multiple forks and you had to know where to put them and which one to use at the right time. I mean, I'm from Georgia, so you basically got a fork. And if you're going to KFC, you got a spork. And that's about it. Spork. Look it up. Uh, so knowledge is influenced by where you are on the social ladder. How much opportunity do you have to travel around the world versus sitting at home and watching it on TV, right? That has a lot to do with how much money that you have. Uh, knowledge is influenced by where you are in history, right? If you were to bring somebody from 100 years ago now and ask them to, you know, get around in this world, um, they would be like doing strange things like asking people for directions instead of just, you know, Google mapping it. I mean, not where we are in history influences uh, how we see the world. 
Is the world flat or is the world round? It depends on... What about me? Is the world flat or is the world round? It depends on where you are in history, uh, where you where you are in the world. And we've also kind of talked a little bit about this, about your physical location. Uh, do you live in the desert? Do you live in the jungle? Do you live in, you know, an urban environment? Uh, it's going to influence how you think about the world. There used to be a TV show on in the early 2000s called The Simple Life, starring Paris Hilton and Nicole Richie. And they were like two city rich girls who would go into the country and everything seems so weird like milking a cow uh but of course if you live in the country i mean i grew up i i milked a few cows when i was because did you know that i used to milk a cow yes and i me got cookie from mommy all right we're, we're about to take a break here and the third thing is uh fourth thing is structure first history second location third are groups just a variety of people that you have uh influence your idea of the reality. If you live in a place where there's only one religion, that one religion dictates what your reality is. But if you live in a place where there are multiple religions, you're going to have a very different picture of reality. Well, you know, they think this way and they think this way. So what we see as normal can be very strange to other people. We talked about this last session. Um, that And now what can be a strange, a normal to us can be very strange to other people. And so one of the ways that we talk about this, and this is something we'll get into in week three, is the notion of culture shock. When we travel, um, Cozy, you, you've been to Mexico a lot of times. What's your favorite yeah. thing about Mexico? How many, you've been to Mexico more times than I can count. What's your favorite thing about going to Mexico? Sugar, sugar skulls. Sugar skulls, yeah, dulces. I mean, anything involving candy. Uh, yeah, you don't have sugar skulls here, do they? Mm -mm. Why do you think that is? Because I don't want people to get sick and... <laughs> right. As she says as she eats a Chips Ahoy cookie. Yeah. Hey, these are our rations during the quarantine. Um, so, you know, when you travel uh, to other places, sometimes it just seems very shocking. Or, you know, I love in, in science fiction that another version of culture shock is time shock. When, travel, when people travel through time. You know, the future or the past seem always so bizarre. Uh, if you're a Star Trek fan, you know, there was always an episode on the original series where they would go back to the 20th century and everybody seemed so primitive. Um, and so this, yeah, that's the frog. That's my grandfather's frog. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. um, that there, this is, before we get to the definition, well, let's just, let's just set it that. We're going to, well, and I'll edit this together because, because we got to focus. Okay, cuz, say peace out. Peace out. <laughs> All right. Peace. Two seconds. All right. We're going to try to wrap this up <laughs> without Cozy. So we're, we're talking about the social construction of reality. We're talking about uh, time shock and culture shock. And so the root of this is a, is a philosophical idea called the Thomas theorem from G.I. Thomas. And this is sort of the core of the social construction of reality. And it, the, the Thomas theorem says... And I'm going to put this up on the screen because it's kind of an important part of this. If people define situations as real, if people, human beings, define, so there's an action there, if people define situations as real, this is reality, they are real in their consequences. They are real in their consequences. And what the consequences refers to is behavior, that we change our behavior based on the definition that we people have created. So, for example... Uh, people thought the earth was flat. You know, they defined that situation as real and it impacted their behavior. They would only sail so far because if you sail too far, you fall off the edge. So their behavior was impacted by their definition. And there was definitely people that sailed too far and never came back. And that's because they just kept going and going and going and got lost and never came back. So it must be true. There's, you know, there's empirical evidence, I guess, that uh, the earth is flat because those people went out and never came back. So they define that situation as real. Um, the world of horoscopes. Think about horoscopes. I'm going to tell you something that might shock you. I am a Pisces. <laughs> so <clears throat> figure out whatever that means. Pisces are all in our heads. I have the same birth date as Kurt Cobain. So we are, you know, we're supposed to be the dreamers, blah, blah, blah. Um, there are, are other signs that have other qualities. We'll probably talk about Virgos. If, if any of you are Virgos, I'm sorry. I was briefly married to a Virgo. It didn't go too well. And let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit about that. She, when we started dating, she uh, put um, 
you know, these are compatibility scores, like how are these different signs, if a Sagittarius and a Capricorn, you know, when it gets together is going to be good or not. And so, you know, and each one, you know, you put one sign in and you put the other person's sign in and it gives you all these, well, they match. And this one, they're really good this way. They're not good this way. They have to work, blah, blah, blah. You know, and all would be like three pages of compatibility. For Percy's, Pisces Virgo, Virgo, all it said it was an exercise in tormenting your soul. <laughs> and I was like, that's BS. You know, that's not real. That stuff isn't. It was totally true. It was totally true. But there are a lot of people that define that notion of the Zodiac as real. I mean, I, I, I tend not to think it is, but... Um, I am kind of a quintessential Pisces, but their behavior will act on it. It was a big thing in the seventies. Hey baby, what's your sign? If you know, we have a compatible sign, then we can go out. Like, so people will define that situation as real and that will impact their behavior. Though the psychic world, my mother is very tied into the psychic phenomena. She used to read tea leaves uh, and she's really into numbers and she won't get on a plane if the numbers aren't right. I mean, she believes that stuff is real. Or as we'll talk about notions of God and what is the sacred. If people define a certain sacredness, a certain definition of sacred, or a book as sacred, or a ritual, or a totem as sacred, that will impact their behavior. I can't do this because it says right here in this book. It's been defined as real, and it's going to impact my behavior. So the Thomas theorem really starts off this notion about how people will act in terms of the definition of their reality. They will act in terms of their definition of reality. So this brings us to Berger and Luckman, uh, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman. Peter Berger, uh, a great sociologist who we'll talk about a little bit later in the course, and Thomas Luck Luckman, also both a religious scholar, uh, and their book, The Social Construction of Reality, that, like I said, comes out when basically everybody is stoned. They're reading it in college. And I'm going to give you the definition, this definition, and I'm going to tell you what the most important part of this definition is. Ready? So, social construction of reality. The process, the process by which people create an understanding of the nature of their environment. The process by which people create uh, an understanding of the nature of their environment. Nature of their environment is just a fancy word of saying reality. The important word here, though, is process. It is a process. There is a process by which we construct reality. And therefore, there's a process by which we can deconstruct it. So there are three steps. A lot of these things have threes. So there are three steps to the social construction of reality. And we are going to be applying this. And this is going to be something that definitely applies to Eisler, and I'm so glad from um, I'm so glad to hear that people are getting a hold of this book and starting to read this book. I can't wait to have a really good discussion uh, next week about this book and what you're thinking about um, the chalice and the blade. Okay, so the three steps of the social construction. Number one is people create stuff. <laughs> people make things. People create sort of two types of things. We create material things. So all the things that have ever been invented, we invent shoes and cell phones and the wheel, and spatulas, and dishwashers, and cars, and Wi-Fi, and potato chips, and farming, and spatulas, and pizza, and everything that's ever been invented. I'm probably spatula, spatulas, uh, and, um, you know, coffee, and coffee cups. Coffee, you know, coffee, you can't just pick a coffee bean and eat it. Ugh, you gotta, like, prepare it a certain way. Thank you, Jesus. We create material things, but we also create non-material things. We create what we call ideational culture. We create things. I was, I'm, you know, during all this shutdown, I'm, we're homeschooling our, our five-year-old, and we were talking about how the United States of America didn't always exist. We were talking about 1776 and the beginning of the construction of the United States of America. When you look at, I mean, as a kid who was watching the Apollo space shots and seeing those first per, uh, pictures of the earth from space, I was like, where's my state? You know, where are the lines? My state's the pink state. I can't see it. Like, where are all the lines? Those lines are human constructions. They are ideas. We create ideas. And we're going to talk a lot about this notion of uh, ideational culture, but just think about the idea of democracy. That's not an inherent idea. That's not a natural idea. We invent it, and we kind of constantly reinvent it, and then we try to hold on to it at the moment. So we invent the notion of race, as we'll talk about. Race, is, race doesn't exist on its own. We construct these categories that we put people into. So the first step of this, and I think this will become clear as we go on, especially when we talk about, you know, sacred things, uh, is that we create stuff, material and non-material things. Step number one of the social construction process. Step number two is we place those 
constructions into our already existing reality. We find a place for them. We find a place for cars. We find a place for toothbrushes. We find a place for democracy. We find a place for all these things we construct. Like one of my favorite social constructions is the concept of Friday. You know, Friday, Friday doesn't exist in the world. Cave people didn't say, oh, thank God it's Friday. Uh, you know, we've constructed this notion of the calendar, We've and we've created seven days, and we've given each day a space and kind of a, uh, you know, an understanding about a Friday. Uh, and so we, that, we found a place for that reality. So the first step is we create it, second place we place it, and the third part, and this is kind of the most important part from a theoretical perspective, is that we create a shared understanding about it. We learn about that reality. We have sort of a shared understanding of that cultural creation, that thing that we created, whether it was a spatula or race, whether it was something little like a toothbrush or something really big like a nation. We develop a shared understanding. And so this is going to be a theme, this notion of shared understanding of social constructions. It is um, how we exist so when I say Friday, people generally, until the shutdown happened, because now every day is, you can't tell. I've had to ask so many times, what day is it? <coughs> what day is it? I don't know what day it is. But generally, in the normal functioning of things, we get excited about Friday. Friday, thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. That was a disco song in the 70s. Um, Friday is the end of the week. Friday is payday. Friday is date night. Friday is go out to the bar. Friday is, you know, all these sort of things that we have sort of, even for people who work on Fridays, it's still, yeah, Friday, the weekend. Um, or I could say dentist, and people generally aren't like, thank God, it's the dentist. No, people are like, Ugh, I hate the dentist, I hate going to the dentist. One of the things I learned in my intro sociology class is that of professions, dentists have the highest suicide rate. Because, you know, people generally don't want to hang out with the dentist, right? It's sort of a bad thing. This, by the way, is how humor works. Uh, what is a joke? What is the idea of a punchline of a joke? Why is it funny? It's funny because we sort of know that there's a double meaning of something. That, that, that we all are kind of in on the joke about why, why this is funny. So my, um, fi I'm, my five-year-old is a lot better at telling jokes. We should get her to tell some jokes if she pops in again. Um, that, uh, so one of her jokes uh, is, um, uh, what does a ghost, uh, what does a panda bear ghost eat? What is it? Panda bear ghost eat. Bamboo. Get it? So the fun, you know, the funny thing is you have to know, you have to develop an understanding that pandas eat bamboo and that boo is also a word that ghosts would use. Like you, that has to be already in your head for that joke to be funny. So the idea of the social construction is that we construct all these realities and then we just sort of forget about the construction. We don't, you know, we think race is absolute. We think, you know, this is what God looks like. And so so I'm going to give you an example of some of the really big ones, some of the really big ones, because this is going to be a little bit of a theme as we go forward in this class. Space. Let's start as big as we can. Space. Space is absolute. Space is real. Might it's there whether we're there or not. But we know, and we've already talked about this, that space, the way we think about space is a human construct. At some point in our human existence, we thought the Earth went around the sun, right? Remember that discussion about Galileo? We thought all the planets, or the Earth, no wait, sorry, the other way around. We thought that the sun went around the Earth, and the planets went around the Earth, and the stars went around the Earth, and then Galileo came along and challenged that social construction, and we're like, no, I think actually we're going around the sun, and the planets are going around the sun, and everybody freaked out. We are constantly changing uh, our notion of space. The idea about black holes, you know, the notion of black hole. I mean, we recently just had the first picture of to, to prove, as much as we believe our scientists, that black holes are real things. Um, there is a fascinating uh, thing that happened in the, in, the, in the early 2000s. So you know what the Hubble, Hubble telescope is, right? When we put a, t a telescope on Earth, it's got to go through clouds and the atmosphere and pollution and birds and planes before you ever get to look at space. So why not launch a giant telescope into space? Uh, and so in 1995, they shot up the t Hubble telescope on the, in the back of the um, space shuttle and could get these sort of clear pictures of space. And it was insane. We got crab nebulas. We got all kinds of color. It wasn't just black and white. We got all this sort of amazing Star trek -y, um, pictures of, of deep space and they took they had this thing called the deep field project where they looked they looked for the blackest part of the sky the part of the sky that had the fewest 
uh, the fewest stars in it, and spent three months just aiming the telescope in that uh, space and zooming and zooming and zooming. And what they found were billions of galaxies, billions of galaxies, like like our galaxy, the Milky Way, which has all kinds of stars and probably has all kinds of planets, and then billions, each with billions of its own stars. And then they went into the darkest part of that and found that, you know, let's aim it there for another three months. They found billions of more galaxies. It's just like, it's massive. It's like so much bigger than we ever thought from this one little project that was done by the Hubble telescope. And it's just like, you know, our notion of space is completely revolutionized by this one little project that was done. And I always think like, well, that totally makes sense because like over there, that's the Star Trek world. Over there, that's the Star Wars world. Over there is Battlestar Galactical world, Firefly, you know, I mean, all these different sort of alternative universes it exists because it just goes so far out there. So our notion of space is constantly being reconstructed. We're a long way from Galileo. We're a long way from Newton, and we're starting to move a long way from Einstein. All these sort of theories about how the world works are all constantly being changed the more we do empirical research to study them. So space, the way we think about space is a social construction. That's number one. Number two is one of my favorites, time. Time. Time is a social construction of reality. Um, we have, in our culture, we have a very linear notion of time, past, present, future. Uh, many cultures have a cyclical version of time. It's spring again. It's the planting season again, or it's the harvest season again. It, time goes in a circle. We also know from our personal experience that time has differing qualities, that time uh, can go very quickly. Can you believe it's already April? Can you believe it's already April? Can you believe it's already 2020? I'm still writing 1920 on my checks. I still have checks. Like, it's just amazing how quickly it goes. It's 2020, like the... the the first year of the of the 2020s is almost half over. It just went, whoo, where did it go? But we also know that time can move very slowly. If you're waiting in a doctor's office or you're waiting for this quarantine to end and like, oh my God, or if you're waiting for this lecture to end, when is it going to end? When is it going to shut up? This is going on forever. The time can move very, very slow. They've invented a machine that actually physically slows down time. It's called the Stairmaster. Uh, go to the gym when the gyms open back up and try to do 20 minutes on a Stairmaster. And it will seem like it goes on forever. It goes on forever. But if you're, you know, out having fun, 20 minutes is over like that. Like, last drink of 20 minutes is like, boop. You know, it just went like, like that. Maybe that, maybe that's just for me. So we know that time uh, has these different qualities in our own lives. Even when we know we try to nail it down to the thing. In our culture, we have a very economic notion of time. Time is money. You spend time, you waste time, you invest your time. Um, so one of my favorite examples of the social construction of time, there's a couple. One is the clock, right? The clock on the wall. That's, that, that's a 14th century invention. It's a, a modern invention that we have sort of this thing that says there are 24 hours in a day, and here's how we're going to break it down. But my favorite is the invention of the modern calendar. And there are multiple calendars in the world. There are, there are Hindu calendars and Ethiopian calendars and uh, Baha'i calendars and uh, Islamic calendars. And, you know, in the year, this is, we think this is 2020, but in the Hebrew calendar, it's the year 5780. So the calendar that we use is called the Gregorian calendar. And the Gregorian calendar is named after a guy named Greg. <laughs> Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. This is kind of a fun story. So before the Gregorian calendar, we used the Roman Julius calendar. And the Roman calendar, the year was 365 days a year. But I think you know that the year is not 365 days, right? It's 365 and a quarter days, roughly. Um, so, you know, we, they were using the spring equinoxes as a way to line up the calendar when in spring it's, you know, the day is as short, the shortest day of the year, longest Short, no, the, when the day is the same, when the, the equinox, this means equal, Randy, uh, when the, the night and the day are the same amount of time. So you use a spring equinox and a fall equinox to line up the calendar. And if you do it based on 365 days, every fourth year, the equinox is going to be on a different day. And it was just messing them up. They couldn't figure it out. So the Pope, Pope Gregory, 
uh, the the 13th, Pope Greg 13. This is in the year of 1582, y'all. 1582. Write that down. In the year 1582, uh, you know, these scholars came to the Pope and said, all right, here's the deal. The calendar is not 365 days. It's 365.2537 days. And we've got a solution. We've got a solution. We will come up with a new calendar. And the new calendar is we'll have 365 days in a calendar. But every fourth year, we will add an extra day, just like we did this year, a leap year. We'll put it. We'll put a day on the end of February, February 29th, and that will keep things kind of in sync with the spring and the fall equinox. And we, well, you can name it after yourself. Call it the Gregorian calendar. We don't care. We just, you know, want to help you get this thing online. But to do that, we got to get everything back on sync. So we got to kind of like turning off a computer and starting it to start this new calendar. We need to chop the 10 days out of the calendar and move the date 10 days forward. Uh, and then we will start the new calendar, and we'll be good. Although the reality, it's a little bit more than 365 and a quarter days. So that's why spring came so early this year. Um, so the Pope, being the Pope, and the Pope, you know, as we talked about before, being connected to God, sends out a papal decree and says, all right, we're going to start a new calendar, and i got to cut 10 days out of the, out of the year, and we're going to start the new calendar. And so we're just going to jump ahead 10 days. How did common people receive that news? They could be like, oh, cool, finally, we've got this riddle of the cosmos all worked out. They flipped out. They thought the Pope, who, you know, talks to God, was taking 10 days out of reality. 10 days when they were going to get paid, or 10 days when they were going to get laid, or 10 days when they were going to get married, or their life would be 10 days shorter. There were riots all across Europe in the 1500s. And um, 1582 when this happened, because they were connected to that social construction that the calendar was a real thing. In fact, it was only a social construction. So there you go. The time is a social construction. I love that example because, you know, we get so stuck to the calendar, but it's just an invention. It's just a thing that people made up. And so you don't have to live and die by it. Anyway, and I love the difference also in, in, in how different cultures think about time. I mean, we're a culture of clock watchers. You know, we really, really, you know, I want to talk to you between 315 and 320. Uh, I love Latin American culture where it's a lot more laid back about uh, time. You know, the bus is leaving around 5 p.m. And my wife's family, you know, they'll say nobody's ever late to dinner, only last. So they're, and they're kind of like, why are you guys so hung up on time? They're a little more chill. Um, okay. So that's number two, space. Number three, the third absolute, and this, by the way, is really good stuff for a midterm, is beauty. Beauty. Beauty seems very biological. Beauty seems like it is something that is deeply woven into our body and our psyche, and you see someone you're attracted to, and there's just something that happens, something that goes, I think that's the sound. Maybe that's just me. That's sort of the sound of it. Beauty is a social construction. When we go around the world, talk to anthropologists around the world, you see how culturally bound, we're going to use that word, culturally bound the concept of beauty is. Beauty changes from place to place, including how it's gendered. There's a tribe in Northern Africa called the Watado where the men paint their faces to attract women. That's, you know, that's where beauty is there. In our culture, beauty is defined as a female thing. People Magazine has like the most beautiful person in America. Um, one of the good things about this is the um, that for a long time in the 20th century was blonde, blue eyes, bright teeth, and a tan. Like I grew up with Farrah Fawcett's poster on my wall when I was, I don't know, 13 years old or something. 12, 12 years old. I didn't become a feminist until 13. Uh, and, you know, that gets worn into people's head of the ideal of beauty. And, of course, you know, there are plenty of people that are beautiful like that. But as we've become more of a diverse society and J-Lo sneaks in. Okay, here's a little story I like to tell. I like to drop a few names of my celebrity encounters. Uh, I used to go to, I'm from Atlanta, Atlanta Braves, home of the Braves, America's team. And I used to sit uh, in the section of the Braves where the Braves wives sat. And, um... As I had a friend that was a ball boy on the team, so I got these really good seats. And we had a right fielder named Dave Justice, and at the time he was married to an up-and-coming actress named Halle Berry. Halle Berry. He used to sit right in front of me every Braves game. And uh, at, she was listed at that at that point as the people people People's Magazine most beautiful person and most beautiful woman in America or whatever, whatever their title is first African American to have that title, 
and we had a little talk about, you know, I was talking as sort of a sociologist about how important it is to have a non-white woman, a woman of color, as a symbol of beauty, because people of color have been told to be ashamed of not being white, to try to look whiter. Um, I think she was a little, thought I was a little weird and maybe wanted to call security, but it was like a real turning point in the 90s when all of a sudden women of color were elevated um, to the status. There's a whole issue around gender and how you know women are defined by their looks and all that stuff that we'll get into. But anyway, the point is beauty is socially defined. Okay, number four, here's a big one. This is a little bit longer than I thought, but it's a good one, is uh, God. We're going to talk about God. We talked about it a, a, you know, a little bit in our chats, and that's what the chalice and the blade is, and that there's a long history of um, genderizing God. But the most of our human existence, and this is what the chalice and the blade is about, and you know, we're, we're certainly talking about this in our, in our chats, uh, there's a long history uh, that says God is not male. Most of our human existence, if the human race has been on earth for 100,000 years that we've been walking erect, most of, <clears throat> most of the historical record shows, for the most of our history, we've seen God as a female. This is not about whether or not God exists or not. This, I don't get paid enough for that. I can't figure that out. Take a philosophy class, they'll tell you. This is about how we construct images of a God. Why do we see God as a 65-year-old white man? How, where, how did that, how, what, huh? <laughs> maybe God doesn't look, maybe God looks like a German shepherd. I don't know. I mean, there could be all kinds of ways that God looks like, but why do we construct this particular racialized and genderized notion of God? So that's what the Eisler book is about. What is the origin of genderizing God? And what about all that goddess history that we don't look at? So I'm just going to leave that because that's something that we're really going to get into and we're really going to talk about as we read the chalice and the blade. And then the last thing is the, um, the notion of moral, ob obs moral, moral absolutes, say it Randy, moral absolutes, that the things that we think are sort of beyond us are still human, human social constructions. So a good example, speaking of God, um, a good example of this is are the Ten Commandments. If you know the story of Moses and the Ten Commandments, when he goes out on the top of Mount Ararat and God gives him the Ten Commandments for people to follow, there's a great comedy movie called History of the World Part One, I think, where God, played by um, the great, oh man, uh, not Carl Reiner, anyway, a great comedian, who, Mel Brooks. Uh, has God gives him the 15 commandments, you know, on three different stone tablets, and he's coming down from the mountain. He says, I bring my people, the and he accidentally drops one of the tablets, and it breaks. He says, the 10 commandments. It's, you know, five of them just smashed. Um, the uh, So number five, I don't know if you know the 10 commandments. Some people think that it's the absolute law of whatever. Uh, Thou shalt not kill, number five. Uh, we kill all the time. What does that mean? Uh, thou shalt not kill. War. We kill people in war. Uh, the death penalty is killing people. A lot of people think if somebody breaks into your house, you can kill them. We're killing all the time. And it just says thou shalt not kill. What about killing animals and plants? Right? I mean, there are people, I mean, even if you're a vegan, you're responsible for the murder of, a, you know, of kale. That kale deserved to live. Uh, there are these people called fruitarians who supposedly just eat fruit that falls out of trees and honey, which seems like it'd be fun for a day, for a day. Um, here's another one, uh, number 10 in the Ten Commandments, and I'll read it, because I used to, if, I don't know which, if you are a Christian, which version of the Bible you have, because there are multiple versions of the Bible, and they're all a little bit different. Uh, I go to the King James Version, but there are all kinds of versions, including like the Lego version and the hip-hop version, so they're all different. They're all written by people, and, and then we're told that they're somehow sacred. Number 10. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Covet. Don't covet. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's probably, probably a good thing. Don't covet. Don't. I mean, that's sort of a Buddhist notion that, you know, desire for things entraps you. But our capitalist system is based on coveting. The whole way our economy is built is, I need that new iPhone. I need that new car. I need that new mochaccino they have at Starbucks. I'm coveting these things, and so I'm going to go work and take my money. The whole Our whole economy is based on coveting. So what the hell is the Ten Commandments all about? right? We're just sort of disregarding it. I mean, the first English translation of the Bible was in 1526. This guy, William Tyndale, dared to take the sort of Latin version and say, 
I think this is part of the Protestant Reformation. Let's translate it to English so people can read it. And what did the Catholic Church do for that great task? Because that's a pretty big book to translate. In the beginning, you know, let them eat cake. No, wait. <laughs> that's, not, <coughs> that's not in the Bible. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's in the Bible. All that sort of good stuff. William Tyndale is the guy that wrote it. If you read the Bible and you like the verse, it's probably because William Tyndale wrote What did the Catholic Church do for that great service? They burned him at the stake. Uh, and so, you know, there are these um, notions of uh, right and wrong that are ultimately social constructions. We're constantly constructing what is right, what is the right thing to do. It's all shades of gray. It all depends on context and social uh, social settings. And so when we talk about these absolutes, yeah, I mean, I think being violent towards a kid is wrong. But, you know, we did a pretty good job in World War II of bombing the shit out of a lot of kids, right? Whether it was in Germany or in Japan with nuclear weapons. So, yeah, right? So, it's, it's wrong, but when it serves our purposes, we'll kill a whole bunch of kids and, and pat ourselves on the back for it. So, uh, so, context is important. So, all right, to wrap this up, the social construction of reality is the process by which we create this reality and then we live by it and we don't see it. And if there is a process by which it's constructed, including ideas about God, ideas about beauty, ideas about time and space, ideas about race, ideas about gender, all the stuff we're going to get into, we can look at that process and therefore deconstruct it. We can deconstruct reality to see well, what went into making it. What went into making it? Why did we need ideas about race in different categories? Why do we have, and this is the main theme, why do we construct an idea of God as a singular man in the sky? What's behind that process? Who did that? Who did that? People did that. People wrote those. I'm one of those people, I don't know about you, but when people on a Saturday knock on my door and they're holding some book that some people define sac as sacred, a lot of people hide. Oh, God, don't answer the door. Don't answer the door. I'm like, let's talk. Let's talk. Who wrote this book that you think is sacred? Who did it? And the hands come down from space on a word processor and write, in the beginning, or did people do that? And if they're divinely inspired, who else might be divinely inspired? I mean, maybe the person that wrote, like, you know, the junk mail that you read was also divinely inspired. Special offer on mattresses. You know, God was talking to them. So it's all social construction. So that's a pretty big, mind-blowing concept to start right on the, on the first week. But I want us to... Uh, Sit with it and think about it, and then we're going to apply it to Eisler. Okay, oh my gosh, that was a bit, that was a bit. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. So we'll talk soon. Okay, I'm going to stop now. Stop talking, Randy, right now.